Better? Okay, great. Anyway, so I heard that our football team did something unusual this weekend, so that was exciting. Congrats to them. Um, today, we are entering a new phase in this class. We have six weeks left, roughly, six and change. And it's time to start digging into sort of the deep conceptual heart of computer science. We've brought you up to speed with the imperative and object-oriented programming skills that you need at least to bootstrap this discussion that we're gonna start to have. Because this is the cool stuff. It really is. I look forward to this day. You guys don't know yet what's coming, so maybe you don't, but this is the point at which things start to get really fun. Because not only is the material that we start to get to talk about a little bit more interesting, I think, it's more core computer science material. This is what differentiates between computer science and programmers. These are the deep conceptual concerns of the field, not just the tools and the skills, the deep questions, the interesting problems and interesting things to think about, but it also is a great way for us to get practice using those imperative programming skills and those object-oriented programming skills that you guys have been developing for the past eight weeks. So, today, the, the third part of this class, we are gonna talk about algorithms and data structures. So that's essentially gonna take us from now until the end of the semester. You have one last quiz this week on interfaces in the CBTF that starts today. And then next week you will have a midterm exam on object-oriented programming that'll cover everything from the second sort of unit of the class. And then after that point, we'll start with some work on algorithms and data structures. So we talked about this at the very beginning of the, the class, but we haven't had a chance to get back to it. But this is gonna be one of the things that we're gonna be talking about starting today is, you know, and again, this is, if you think about computer science as a conceptual discipline, as an intellectual pursuit, this is right at the core of it, right? Algorithms and data structures. How do we solve problems? in this methodical, systematic way that we can then show a computer how to replicate for us, right? So, you know, the, an algorithm is some sort of problem-solving strategy that we can then replicate and implement and show a computer how to do, right? It's especially something, you know, again, we look back at the word history of this uh, word the history of the usage of this word, and it really started to take off around the time computers started to be something that we were being uh, using to solve problems. So an algorithm is a, is a very specific set of steps, a process to, for solving a problem. Now one of the things, you know, uh, and, and this is a hard distinction to draw right now, um, because you guys are only, have only seen Java, and that's the only programming language that we're gonna use throughout the rest of the semester, I promise that I won't drop some Python in or some Rust in or Go in just for fun. Um, but there is a difference between the algorithm and its implementation, okay? We are going to implement a bunch of, you know, interesting data structures and algorithms using Java. But the Java implementation is not the algorithm. The algorithm lives outside of your code. Your code is a reflection of the steps that the algorithm prescribes. Your code is the translation of that algorithm into Java, and you could also write it in Python, or in C++, or in D, or whatever. I mean, you can take an algorithm, and actually you can find websites that do this, where, you know, they have a classic algorithm, and then they have implementations of that algorithm in, like, every programming language known to man. And so again, the algorithm is the set of problem-solving steps. And when we talk about algorithms, I, you know, we'll be looking at Java code, but I want you guys to try to remember that what we're really doing is talking about a series of steps that we take to solve a problem. We happen to implement those in this class in Java, but that doesn't, that's just a result of the fact that that's the language you guys know a little bit at this point. Okay, so, now again, it, what we do as computer scientists frequently is we implement algorithms. That's what we're gonna start doing now. That's what you guys are gonna do in 225. That's what you guys are gonna do downstream in some of your other courses. We're gonna learn about an algorithm and its properties in the abstract, because we can talk about an algorithm outside of the implementation. And then we're gonna implement that algorithm using the imperative and object-oriented programming skills that you guys know how to do. 
so we know how to make simple calculations. These are sort of the building blocks that we have when we talk about algorithms. We can do simple math, we can store results, we can make simple decisions using our conditional statements, right? This is the imperative programming part of the class, and we can repeat these steps extremely quickly. So repetition is one of our tools. These are all the building blocks of the algorithms that we're gonna talk about, okay? The, the data structure is part of the class, so, you know, the, the, we're gonna talk about these two things kind of together, and we're kind of just gonna bounce back and forth between algorithms and data structures as we feel comfortable, um, and depending on the things we wanna talk about, right? Um, a data structure in computer science is a collection of data that we've structured in some particular way. We've seen data structures already. We've seen algorithms already, too. We've seen data structures. We've seen arrays. Raise the data structure. It's not a complicated data structure, but it's a, it's a simple data structure. And then along with data structures come new ways of working with the data that is stored by that data structure. That's why we structure data in certain ways. So when we talk about trees, for example, we talk about binary trees, binary trees are going to give us the ability to implement new algorithms for accessing the data that's stored inside the tree. The list implementations that we start working on towards the end of this week are gonna each give us different, the same ways of accessing the data inside the list, but with different trade-offs in terms of the amount of time it takes to perform certain operations. So for data structures, you know, essentially what we're gonna do here is we're gonna lean on our object-oriented programming knowledge that we've been uh, working up for the past month. So we're going to be using the primitive types and combinations of other objects to build the, uh, build up these data structures that we're gonna be talking about, whether it's a list or a tree or something else, okay? Uh, we'll utilize existing data structures like arrays when appropriate, um, and then references become a big part of what we do for the next month. Okay, that's one of the reasons that we talked about references, we talked about objects. You know, in particular, unfortunately, a lot of the object-oriented content in the class, and maybe we could structure it differently, and maybe we could structure it better, but a lot of it may seem like a lot of machinery that you weren't sure what to do with. Well, now we're getting to the point of the class where we're gonna talk about what to do with that machine. So these two topics are really, you know, I see them as highly complementary. You know, I don't think you should be able to teach a data structures course, because the course on data structures is never just on data structures always on algorithms and data structures. You shouldn't be able to teach a course that's just on algorithms, because a course on algorithms is never really just about algorithms. It's about algorithms and data structures, okay? We implement algorithms that utilize specific features of data structures in order to work. So when we implement search on top of a binary tree, we're exploiting the structure of the tree in order to make the search more efficient. Same thing with data structures. The data structures that you guys learn about here and then you learn about in 126 if you take it and learn about in 225, they don't exist because somebody thought it was cool. Hey, let's make a tree because trees are pretty and then I can store data in it, it'll be pretty too. You know, trees are nice. You know, they're, particularly at this time of year, they change colors nicely. No, that's not why you put data into a tree. Put data into a tree because then you can do things with that data. It's kind of cool. Okay, and again, this is, our chance to bring together the imperative and the object-oriented programming skills that we've been learning and put them to use doing something really cool. Okay, and then along the way, you know, sorry, I keep being surprised by my own slides, then along the way, we're gonna introduce some new things, right? So we're gonna introduce some new machinery, we're talking about algorithms, we'll start talking about that today, and then particularly some new object-oriented concepts. So we're gonna talk about generics, we're gonna talk a little bit, um, about some other features of Java's object model that come in handy as we start to work uh, with data structures and algorithms. Okay, so let's, so one of the things I wanna point out here too, you guys may have this, you know, perception that, you know, all, I think I was, I was listening to some students talking the other day, you know, I think you guys have this, this misconception that all the interesting problems in computer science are kind of solved, you know? You guys showed up too late. You were born too late. You know, people got here earlier, did all the cool stuff, and there's nothing left to work on. And, and the truth couldn't, couldn't be farther from, from, from that, right? Over the past couple decades, 
we've seen massive advances in computer science fueled by new algorithmic techniques. So just one that I'll throw out there for you to think about. How many, you know, how many people have noticed that, like, Google seems to know what a picture of a cat is? You upload a picture of a cat, Google knows there's a cat in that photo, right? Like, how? I mean, that is sort of, like, it's a little bit weird, right? Does Google have a bunch of big data centers full of people sitting around being like, cat, no cat, cat, no cat, no cat, no cat, no cat, maybe a cat, cat, no cat? No. It's all done by a computer. This is a computer algorithm. That algorithm was enabled by other algorithmic advances that were made extremely recently. So deep learning, some of the core deep learning algorithms um, were enabled by algorithmic, you know, algorithmic invention that happened relatively recently. None of those algorithms, none of that technology would be possible without recent discoveries in the area of algorithms. So this is not a dead, empty field with nothing interesting left to do. There are a lot of cool problems out there. And this is an example of a place where, you know, one change, one new idea, one new way of doing things gave birth to this entire beautiful field of new cool stuff, right? A lot of the AI that you guys work with is built on models that are trained using this particular technique. Okay, but let's talk about something simple, something that is a solved problem, right? Although, to be honest, actually, when we come back and talk about hashing and about uh, computer security a little bit towards the end of the semester, this is kind of an open problem, too, actually, working with, with the, this is in the space where there's actually some interesting open problems. Okay. So here's an example of an algorithmic problem. All right, I have two integers, and I want to find their greatest common divisor, or greatest common denominator. Given two integers, that is the number, the largest number, that divides both of those integers evenly. Okay? And, and I, actually, I can extend the idea, so we'll talk about, we'll, we'll do the GCD for a pair of integers, but you can extend this to a whole set. So if I give you n integers, what's the largest integer that divides all n of those even? Okay? So if you go online, you will find, you know, on the Wikipedia page for GCD, a incredibly detailed and interesting example of how to solve this problem. Uh, using a variety of different uh, algorithms, There's something called Euclid's algorithm, goes back a long time. Again, this is this is close to being a solved problem, okay? And you can implement these if you want. But I want to use this as an example of talking about something a little simpler. But we're then going to come back and and uh, distinguish at the end of class, okay? But what if you know it's like you know somebody puts this up on the board? You're interviewing for some company. And they say, look, I don't really want a super efficient solution to this problem. This is essentially like a fizz buzz type problem. I just want to see you solve it, okay? Don't worry about how long it takes. I just want a solution to GCD, okay? So you can memorize Euclid's algorithm. That might impress some interviewers. Or what can you do? All right, so let's, let's think about, so, so the solution that we're going to work out together right now is in a category of solutions, when we start talking about algorithms, that's sometimes known as a brute force solution, okay? Um, I, I can never resist bringing this up, so when I used to review papers um, in mobile systems, there was some author who would always use the term brutal force instead of brute force. When they're talking about brute force, I'm gonna use brutal force, okay? So we're not trying to kill the problem, all right? The goal is not to execute the problem. Right? We're not using brutal force, uh, we're using brute force, though, right? What does that mean? It's kind of like, you know, if you need to solve a problem, just try harder. Like, force it. My mom always said, don't force it, but we are, that's what we're gonna do. However, in algorithm analysis, brute force actually has a, a very specific meaning, okay? And, and the meaning is, basically, try all the possible solutions until you find one that solves the problem. So this assumes that I have some way of checking whether or not each candidate satisfies the requirement. So if I go back to my, my problem statement for GCD, do I have a way of checking what, if I gave you an integer, 
and I gave you a set of integers, and I said, does this integer divide all of those evenly? You could figure that out, right? We use the modulus operator, the remainder operator in Java, and so I can test a particular solution, okay? And so a brute force solution to this problem says, let's just go one by one. We're gonna take all the numbers that could potentially possibly be a solution, and we're just gonna try them one after another, okay? So in order, and now, now keep in mind, you know, again, this, this doesn't work for every problem because what we need is we need a way of checking whether or not the solution is correct, okay? We have that here. Um, what we don't know is how to pick good numbers, right? We can check a number if you give me one, but I don't know which ones I should pick as opposed to which ones I should avoid, okay? Now here's the thing about this approach, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm raising this I don't want you guys to think I'm like a, a Philistine or something. I'm raising this as both an observation as, a, a, as, as a warning, okay? Your computers have gotten to be just, you know, obnoxiously fast. You guys have access to, I mean, and it's really true, right? It's one of those things that, you know, if you, if you keep a gratitude journal, one of the things you should write down today is I'm grateful for how powerful computers are, right? You know, the phone in your pocket is literally as powerful as supercomputers were maybe 20 years ago. That is actually true, right? That is changing the world in ways that we can't begin to understand, and you guys are the beneficiaries of that. So, you've got access to all this horsepower. That's good. Sometimes it means that you don't need a sophisticated solution to solve a problem, okay? So sometimes when you're getting started and a problem comes up, as part of a system or a program you're trying to write or a system you're trying to build, a reasonable thing to do is to try something simple. Try something simple, something that's easy to understand, something that's easy for you to reason about, and see how well it performs, okay? If it's too slow, then you can go back and implement something more sophisticated. And when you look at how certain companies evolve, you see this all the time. You know, you know Twitter started off doing some dumb things, and as they got big and, and popular, they fixed those things with more sophisticated alternatives that allowed their site to work better, okay? All right, so let's, let's do this example together, okay? So I've got my simple math class. This is to avoid colliding with the math class that's already existing. Let's declare a method called public static int gcd. This is gonna take two integers for now, let's just return zero. I think check style is gonna make, oh yeah, okay, fine. Fine check style, you're gonna win. Been defeated by my own creations here, okay. All right, so I've got my little method skeleton here. All right, so, so let me, let me do the first, um, let's actually, let's actually do this. So let's say uh, public static, let, let's, let's make a helper function here, let's say, private boolean check int first int second int divisor, I call this n. All right, so I want my check function here to return true if n divides both of them and return false if it doesn't. I don't know if n is the greatest divisor at this point, but I just want to figure out, is it a divisor or not? Maybe what I should do is call this is divisor. All right, how do I implement this helper function? Got two integers. Don't worry about error checking for now. We can do that in the, the main function. Yeah. Yeah, Java's remainder operator. Be careful what you call it, because it's not actually a modulus. Um, so I know, you know, you guys, and, and this is sort of review now, right? Um, let's just do this for now. Let's do, um, let's have this return zero, but let's just remind ourselves about how this operator works. First, remainder, second, and it's angry about this, all right. So the modulus operator in Java, what does it do? it returns the remainder when I take one number and divide it by another number. So the first divided by the second. So if I look here, um, the first thing that's printed 
is put this right. Ten and eight is two because if I divide ten by eight, I have two left over. Okay. Okay. So how do I use the remainder operator to determine that a number divides another number evenly? What value will that return? So eight does not divide ten evenly. What value will this, the modulus return, or the remainder operator return, when one number divides another number evenly? Yeah, zero, bingo. Okay, so let's return first modulo n is equal to zero, and second, I, I'm, I'm sorry I keep saying modulo, remainder. And I'll put some nice parentheses in here just to make this pretty. Okay. So there's my check function. Like I said, in order to apply a brute force solution, I need the ability to actually check things efficiently. This isn't just one line of code, it's also fast. So this is, you know, this is something that, that is not gonna slow me down very much. So I can check things quickly, okay? All right, so now I've got a starting point here, um, but I'm not done, obviously. So now, what do I do? So now I have my way of checking. How do I apply my brute force solution to this problem? Someone give me just a English language description of what I'm gonna do. I have a way of checking a value. I have the two values that I wanna find the greatest common denominator for. Maybe a, maybe a good way to start is, what's the, what's the smallest number that can be the greatest common denominator? One. And one sometimes is the greatest common denominator if I have two numbers that are what's called relatively prime. So if they don't share any factors, then one's the, the, the greatest common denominator. What's the largest number that can be the greatest common denominator of two numbers? The smallest of the two, right? Because if I get bigger than that, I'm not gonna divide the small one, um, small one evenly, okay? So let's do this, let's say int smallest is equal to first, and then we'll say if second is less than first, smallest is equal to second, okay? So here's a little snippet of code where I'm declaring a local variable called smallest and I'm setting it to be the smaller of first and second. So now I'm applying this brute force uh, search technique. And actually I need to go equal to smallest. So let's go back to my brute f definition of brute force. I'm gonna systematically enumerate all possible candidates. That's my loop. All possible candidates is numbers that are greater than one, greater than or equal to one, and less than or equal to the smaller of the two numbers that I want to compute the GCD for. So the GCD has to be in here somewhere, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check. I'm gonna say if is divisor first, second, n, return n. Okay? Let's try this. I've got, I've got, I've got some concerns about this. Um, oh, I need to make this static. That's correct. Okay. Uh-oh. This doesn't look right. What's my problem here? Yeah. Yeah, I want to find the largest value, not the smallest, okay? And the observation is that I'm starting at the bottom. And in fact, I know exactly what's gonna happen here. One is always going to work. One is the divisor of everything. So I will always get one here. So what I need to do is I need to turn this loop around. So let's say, let's start at the smallest value. Let's continue, this is great imperative programming review, while we're greater than one, and let's work down. Okay. So now it looks like I have something that's more reasonable. And 
just as we were doing, if we were writing this as a library or we were actually gonna, you know, writing this as part of an assignment or for someone else to use, I have some test cases here, okay? So 10 and eight. What's the correct greatest common denominator of 10 and eight? It's two, right? Both even, three doesn't work, four doesn't work, five, six, seven, eight don't work either, okay? 150, this is a case where the greatest common deno divisor is one of the numbers. So this is a good test case to make sure that my algorithm works properly. Here, 50 is actually the greatest common divisor. It's kind of obvious, 100 is 50 times two. Down here, I pulled two numbers that are relatively prime, okay? So one of them, and, and here, it's a little, our intuition breaks down a little bit. What's one thing about this that would, that would set off your alarm bells if, if the answer wasn't one? What are two numbers, don't run it, but let, let's say I change this to this, okay? What do I expect? I don't know exactly what the result is, but can the answer here be one? Is it possible for the answer here to be one? So I'm gonna make an argument for or against. Yeah. Yeah, they're both even, right? One ends at eight, the other ends in zero. Good old, you know, elementary school math. They're even numbers. Therefore, the answer can't be something smaller than two. It could be bigger if it turns out they have another common factor. Okay, good. So here's my obligatory sort of, you know, Hulk life. This is what this is. This is a brute force algorithm. So again, let's identify the different parts of it based on our definition. I'm gonna systematically enumerate all possible candidates. That's this chunk right here. All right? I'm gonna check whether or not each candidate satisfies the problem statement. I've actually written this so that my check is isolated as a separate function. So, so again, if you go and you look up Euclid's algorithm, it's much smarter than this. And this is not what you should do, all right? But, particularly for small cases, and if you were just, you know, if this was just a small part of your program and it wasn't that important, this might be okay. Right? All right, so. And, and again, this is a good thing, but it's, this is a double-edged sword. Partly because your computer is really fast. And so it's gonna make, you know, again, let's go back and let's look at this, right? Is, is there any sense in which you would describe this as being slow? I mean, it's not slow, right? Um, and so you can get, Sometimes that means you're okay. Sometimes it means you fooled yourself into thinking that this is a solution to a problem that is gonna really come up and bite in the future, all right? And so what we're gonna do throughout the rest of the class is we're gonna talk about some of the ways this can go sideways. And we're gonna start learning about how to categorize problems into different uh, complexity classes based on how they behave is the problem gets harder and harder. So when we talk about algorithms for solving problems, for the rest of the semester, one of the things that's gonna consume us, and you guys will see this again in 173 and again in 225, this is a big part of being a computer scientist, is understanding algorithm performance. In order to understand algorithm performance, we need to have a language to talk about, right? But why does it eventually matter? Why does speed eventually matter? So one of the reasons is the problem starts to get bigger. So you wrote a function to search for a record among, let's say you have a list and you were looking for an item in the list. And it worked great. Your test cases passed really fast as long as the list only had 50 items. But then, you know, your manager at Google's like, okay, well, we're gonna deploy this on our, you know, cloud backend and it's gonna now have to process 50 trillion items. It's a much bigger problem. Sometimes an algorithm that seems fast on a small problem gets extremely slow on a big problem. The other thing that can happen is, you know, and again, like your computer's really fast. It's hard to write a slow program on your computer today. If you've done that, then you have sort of accomplished something in the sense that like you are wasting a lot of compute, right? And that you may not like that. At some point when your startup takes off, you're gonna actually have to pay for computing power. I was actually reading something interesting the other day. The number one, Am Amazon's number one revenue source 
Anyone know what it is? Amazon Web Services. It's not all the crap you guys buy online. It's selling computation to other companies. Amazon has data centers all over the world with machines, and you can go online right now. Don't do this because you guys need to pay attention, but you can go online right now, and for free, you guys can fire up a machine in the cloud somewhere, and you can start using it for stuff. And when you start your little startup, you may start with 10 machines in the cloud run by Amazon. But here's the thing. You're gonna pay them a bill every month. That bill is gonna be determined on how many operations your computer's performed. If they're doing things in dumb ways, that bill is gonna be bigger. Your profits are gonna be lower. Your company may go out of business. If they start doing things in smarter ways, this may be better. You may have customers that complain about performance, or you're in a job interview. There you go. Bring it at home to something that's really important um, when you need to impress somebody with your knowledge of, of algorithms. But this is actually a real thing, right? As a computer scientist, people are gonna expect you to know what the limits are for how we solve problems, how different algorithms perform, and what some of the core challenges are in this space, right? So if you go into an interview and you're like, I can sort a list of integers in ON, they're gonna be like, next candidate. Um, you know, you gotta know that that's not possible. Okay. So how long is this algorithm going to take? Right, so let's think about this. Let's say we're computing the GCD of four and six. And in fact, it's for fun, because this is fun. Let's go back here. And I'm gonna keep track. How am I gonna do this? Let's see, public static int steps is equal to zero. I'm gonna say steps is equal, you know what? I don't, this is bad, this is bad. Oh, no, that's, this is fine. This is gonna work. All right, so when I start my algorithm, I'm gonna reset my step count. Every time I call my isDivisor function, I'm gonna record that it got called. So this is some, on some level, a measure of how many steps it's taking to run this algorithm. And now after I run it, I'll print the step count. All right, and let's print this in a nice way. All right. There we go. All right, so. And then we'll do this, and then we'll do this. Okay. So, 10 and eight took seven steps. Why? What were the steps? The ste each step here is a number that we had to try. What were the numbers we had to try? We had to try eight, right? We started at eight. We tried eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, two. That was it. So we got seven steps to get to the answer. Yeah. Oh, hello. There we go, thank you. All right, what about 150? This one we got lucky. This was what can happen, right, when we start to talk about algorithm analysis. Sometimes there's a case that's really easy. So in this case, we started at 50, and bingo, we found the answer right away, okay? That's an example of a best case scenario for this algorithm, which is that the GCD is the smaller of the two numbers. I can find it immediately. I can't do any better than that. Euclid's algorithm is still not gonna do better than that for that combination of numbers. But here's a bad case, right? So look at the bottom. I started at 65,270, and it took me 65,269 steps to get to the answer. And the reason was, well, let me make this seven again, and then we'll it'll take one more step. Yeah, the answer's one. I had to start all the way from the top and go through all of these numbers to get to one. And you know, again, if you know anything about math, you realize, like, this is dumb. There are all sorts of numbers that I should be skipping along the way because I know that they can't be the GCD, right? Um, you know, so, so anyway, so this is not, not a good solution, right? Um, and it's gonna perform, you know, uh, more poorly as things get bigger and depending on exactly how things work, right? So if we think in general, okay? And again, this is hard to do, but we're gonna get practice over the next few weeks. Um, how, if I give you M and N, 
And let's say that n is smaller than m, without loss of generality. How long is this algorithm going to take? Well, okay, what's the best case scenario? We've already seen the best case scenario. In the best case scenario, how many steps does it take? What's true in that case? M is a multiple of n. So if m is equal to, like, some constant times n, then I'm done, because my first number I try, n, finished. What's the worst case scenario? n. I start at n, I have to go all the way to 1. It's gonna take n steps, okay? Average case here is hard, and we're not gonna get into that. It really depends on the distribution of the, how the numbers work. But, worst case scenario, it can take n steps. And here's the thing. When n gets really, really big, this algorithm slows down a lot. So much so that this is, this is not exactly quite it, but it's close to being the basis for modern computer security. The reason why you can communicate with your bank safely is because certain number theory operations take a long time when numbers get really big. And so when you start, this is actually true, when you start a, like if you went to your bank website right now, as long as you have a bank that's like not terrible, okay, you and your bank are gonna negotiate a set of really big numbers that you're gonna use to secure the transaction. And the reason why nobody can detect, can, no one can figure out what you're communicating with each other, which could be incredibly sensitive information, is because it takes too long to solve certain problems when you're given really, really big integers. Okay, so this stuff matters. Okay, so I have 10 minutes left. Let's fly through the complexity classes, which we will then come back to on Wednesday. Okay, so here's one of the things that we're gonna come back and do frequently from now until the end of the semester, is that we're gonna analyze our algorithms. So what does this mean? Essentially what we're trying to do is a general version of what we just did for GCD. We wanna figure out how long the algorithm is going to take. Um, and frequently we're gonna use this to put an algorithm into a category, okay? I'll show you the categories in a minute. Not always, we don't necessarily always wanna count every tiny little thing the algorithm does. We just wanna have a sense of what's its behavior like. Now, a lot of times when we do this, we don't care about specific inputs. I don't care about how the GCD performs with a specific set of numbers. I wanna be able to make a more general statement about how it performs on any set of inputs. That's a lot harder to do. If you give me two inputs, I can tell you exactly how long it's gonna take. But if you give me two general inputs, I need to think harder about how long it's gonna take. But that's what we're going to do, okay? So here's some of the questions we're gonna ask ourselves. Are there particular inputs that are hard for a particular algorithm? Our GCD algorithm that we just wrote, if you give it two numbers that are relatively prime, they share no common factors, that's the worst possible case because it has to start at the smaller of the two and walk all the way to one, okay? So best, worst, and average case running time. So best case, we just looked at. One of the numbers is the GCD. Worst case, they don't share any factors and I have to walk to one. Average case gets trickier, right? It requires averaging over a population of inputs that we may not fully understand. Okay. But overall, one of the core factors here is how is the algorithm's performance related to its inputs? If I think of it a simple problem, it's gonna take so long, but then if I make that problem 10 times harder, or 100 times harder, or 1,000 times harder, or a billion times harder, how long is it going to take, okay? All right, and that's where we get to this, right? So, um, wait, sorry. So the, when, a lot of times, too, what we'll do is we'll actually talk about what happens um, at the limit. So as m and n go to infinity, how does the performance of the algorithm behave? And there's reason for this. For first of all, is it's really actually very useful to understand how the algorithm performs, how an algorithm performs when the problem gets really hard. The second reason is, at that point, all these other little details, they kind of fall away. Okay, so, so let, me, let me give you an example of this. Again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna 
race back here to my, my algorithm. So if, if we look at the GCD algorithm that we wrote, there's this little chunk of code right here from lines nine to 12 that's basically just figuring out what the smallest value is. That takes the same amount of time regardless of what the two values are, okay? This stuff down here, this loop, is what's gonna dominate performance once the numbers get bigger. So if I try a small number, it's possible that half of the runtime of my algorithm is consumed doing this stupid little calculation. It's not stupid, it's important, but if I give you really big numbers, right, then my algorithm spends a lot of time racing around in this loop down here, okay? And so that's why we think frequently about algorithm performance at the limit, right? At the, at the point where my inputs get extremely, uh, big. Okay, so, let's meet our complexity classes. When we talk about algorithm complexity, a lot of times what we're gonna try to, what we're gonna be trying to figure out is what category, there's two things we need to figure out. First of all, what is N? What's the feature of the inputs that drives performance? We'll talk more about that next time. The second thing is, what category does the algorithm go into? Okay, is it an O, it, well, you guys are gonna start to th say things like, is this an O-N algorithm versus a O-N squared? Okay? Here's why this matters. And again, I want, I want to point out something to you. So this is the performance, um, and this is just, you know, operations, whatever. You can think of this as runtime, okay? This is the size of the input. Over here on the graph is labeled the, what are called the complexity classes. And what you can see is that their, how long they take varies very differently, right? So let's, let's start in the middle here. Actually, let's start right here. So this is what's called O-N. O-N means that the algorithm, the performance of the algorithm varies as a linear function of the input. So if you make the input twice, if you make the problem twice as hard, the algorithm takes twice as long. So you can see that, it's a line, all right? That's not too bad. Com particularly when you compare it with something like this guy, okay? This is O-N squared. So now, how long the algorithm takes varies with the size of the problem or the difficulty of the problem squared. So if I make the problem 10 times harder, the algorithm takes 100 times longer, right? We even have some worse cases here. So this is, oh, way down here, we're not actually gonna talk about, oh, actually, you know what? I lied. There is an O-N factorial algorithm we'll talk about. It's a fun one, okay? O-N factorial, look at this. This is like a rocket ship taking off in a bad way, okay? Like, imagine that you wrote that and, and, and deployed it as part of a product or a service, okay? You will be looking for a new job, right? As soon as, as soon as any type of load uh, starts to hit your system. But here's the thing, okay? This is, this is the, this is the cautionary tale about this graph. Look down here, okay? Right at the origin. They all look the same. It's not until the problem gets a little bit bigger. I mean, by the time you get to like four or five, like Owen's factorial's off the graph. It's like, peace out, I'm out of here. I'm going to the moon. But if you just run simple test cases and you don't understand how your algorithms actually perform, you might actually come up with an O-N factorial algorithm and think it's good. You might think, oh, this is great. I'll just, you know, push this out today. You know, my test case is all passed, no problem. Um, I'm good, right? It's very easy to get fooled because of how powerful your computers are when you use small inputs, that down here, everything is kind of cool. Nothing's very slow. But, you know, you get out here, and now you're seeing these big differences between even, you know, O-N squared, which is gone, right, and algorithms that are, that are faster, okay? So I'm gonna skip this. We'll come back and do this next time. But I do wanna do, uh, where'd it go? Right, okay. So let me close with this, right? Oop. Where'd my graph go? Okay, here's my graph again. So again, I just want to impart the importance of this topic. And the sophistication that you can gain as a computer scientist by understanding this, all right? If, so here's the difference, you know, here's why we talk about algorithms. Because 
a dumb algorithm makes an easy problem harder, okay? So we haven't talked about, I have, a, I have a, an algorithm that we'll talk about next time that tests whether or not an array is sorted. My, my algorithm is O n squared. That problem should be in the category O n. I've made it harder. My algorithm takes longer than it needs to. It's wasteful, right? As a computer scientist, I should know that. You guys will know that by the end of the semester. On, in contrast, and again, this is where we see advances to this day. When you come up with a smart algorithm, a clever way of doing something, you're actually taking a hard problem and making it dramatically easier, right? So again, our way of finding the greatest common denominator was O n. That's actually the category it's in, because it's based on the minimum, and I have to potentially walk all the way to one. Euclid's method is O log n. So let's go back and look at the, uh, the complexity categories again, right? So here's O n, and here's O log n. O log n is down here. You can't even see O log n. O log n's like hanging out with the x axis, all right? So if you take, so imagine you're out here and you're using our stupid GCD implementation, but you could use Zuculet's algorithm, look at all this time that you're wasting. Time that your customers are spending waiting for your site to refresh, you know, time that you're being billed by Amazon for, uh, time that, you know, your demo is loading really slowly when you're pitching something to a VC or whatever. Okay, so on Wednesday, we're gonna come back and go th through the complexity classes carefully. Um, I don't have ops hours today, I do have them Wednesday. Um, good luck to the orange team who's finishing up MP2 tonight. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Enjoy lab tomorrow. <laughs>